Yesterday, the Supreme Court of Canada heard learned arguments on the vexed question whether you can testify in court with a bag on your head. They are now expected to ponder the matter for four to six months. It shouldn't be that hard. They should just say no. The case involves a Muslim woman accusing relatives of childhood sexual abuse who wishes to testify in a niqab, a face mask with a narrow eye slit, because she claims God thinks someone is defiled if a man who is not her close relative looks upon the face of a female. Now, I've already expressed my opinion about the whole business of making girls go about in sacks. Covering your hair or your ankles might be exaggerated modesty, but covering your face to deal with others? Think of the list of people who do it. Robbers, Klansmen, Imperial Stormtroopers, Executioners. Right, it's deliberately hostile and dehumanizing. When I wrote about this last year, I said, and I still say, if we were allowed to shun people who mask themselves, to refuse to deal with them socially or professionally, I'd be prepared to defend their right to wear masks. But since we're not, since one consequence of being given a charter of rights is that we lost the right of free association, despite being explicitly promised it, I want the decob banned. I sure don't want to see it in court. Unfortunately, the Charter puts the Supreme Court in an awkward position. The sorcerer's apprentices who inflicted this monstrosity on us had no understanding of our Constitution or what their mutilation of it would cause. Despite the feeble rearguard action of a handful of premiers trying to protect parliamentary sovereignty with a half-baked notwithstanding clause, Pierre Trudeau largely replaced British liberty with French Revolution-style rhetorical rights, high-sounding but procedurally vacant, over-promising and under-delivering. Real rights don't come from positive affirmations of something like freedom of religion, which could mean anything but probably doesn't. They consist of a series of prohibitions on what private people or agents of the state may do to you. That's why the American Bill of Rights doesn't offer freedom of religion or freedom of speech, but says, quote, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. And that's not some weird Yankee innovation. innovation. It's their effort to codify the system they, like we, inherited. As Alfred Van Dicey wrote in The Law of the Constitution about Britain, quote, With us, freedom of the person is not a special privilege, but the outcome of the ordinary law of the land enforced by the courts, end quote. Thus, he says, there's no such thing in Britain as freedom of the press. All there is, and all you need, is the ordinary rights of ordinary people to do things that are not specifically forbidden. Since no one has the right to shut you up by force, you can talk and write. If anyone tries to interfere with you buying or renting a building, your staff entering it once they're hired, bringing in printers, paper and ink, nowadays computers of course, and offering the results for sale to willing buyers, you can get a writ either ordering them to stop blocking the door or summoning them to court to answer for smashing your presses. Procedure is the key guarantor of liberty. Our charter rights don't offer it, quite the reverse. Some of the legal procedure stuff is okay, but while large parts of the charter read like a blank check, including its sweeping affirmation of freedom of conscience and religion, the whole notion of rule of law is rescinded by clause one. It says, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms guarantees the rights and freedoms set out in it, subject only to such reasonable limits prescribed by law as can be demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society. In short, you're promised everything in the cosmos provided the learned justices happen to feel it might work on that particular day. Do you feel lucky? Huh? Do you? I don't. I never know what the court will say. But real freedom of religion, like real freedom of the press or of association, simply means no one can keep you for buying or renting premises on which, if you choose, you may discourse on the metaphysical with whoever you want to invite who wants to come. It never meant, and it never should mean, that you can release noxious smoke from the building in service of the deity, fill it beyond fire code limits, skip rent payments, or do anything else otherwise prohibited because you claim, this time, it's for God. That's also why you cannot testify in disguise. A fundamental premise of ju principle of justice is you shall not be convicted without facing your accuser. And facing is not just a word here. Humans being what they are, looking another per at another person's face is essential to dealing with them. The expressions tell you what their words mean, whether they're to be trusted, where we stand with them. You and your lawyer and the judge must see the witness. Not inshallah, period. If the court wants to protect their rights, it should adhere as closely as possible to the older understanding of freedom, as welling up from prohibitions on specific offensive conduct, not descending in a sweet-smelling cloud from the Empyrean realm, realms of Philosopher's King. And it should say, if you can't testify in court with a bag on your head because you feel like it, you can't do it because you feel like God feels like it. 
Freedom of religion isn't an aggressive, special, privileged thing that lets you do things others can't, depriving them of their normal rights like facing their accuser to satisfy your psychological needs. It's a necessary consequence of you having the same rights as other people, no more and no less. Now show your face or get out. I'm John Robson and that's the byline.